With this locomotive, Hornby have got everything right. Hornby have captured the likeness on this locomotive perfectly. <laughs> Hi there, welcome back for another box opening and review video here on the Jenny Kirk channel and today we've got a big ticket item, this is one of the Hornby train packs so without further ado let's take a closer look. Well this is, um, well, I suppose you could call it new old stock, I bought this from a model shop where they've had it in stock for quite some time, it's catalogue number is R2888M and uh, the, the 28 there on there means uh, it's from actually well over 10 years ago. So if you can find these new old stock items, the prices tend to actually be quite keen. So it's always worth having a rummage in some of the smaller model shops that are out there, ones which don't necessarily have a high throughput. And this particular one, uh, I paid what has been its RRP, uh, £150. But in this day and age, that is actually a really good price. So well worth looking out for these. And this train pack is uh, it's the Flying Scotsman train pack. And it has to be noted that this is the train, not the locomotive. And it's something that uh, <laughs> I suppose it's quite a common misconception that you say Flying Scotsman in this day and age, and a lot of people think immediately of the Flying Money Pit. Um, I know, cruel name, but a lot of people have dubbed it that. But that locomotive only really became famous in the, I suppose, late 60s and into the 70s when it went on its global tour running across Australia and latterly America and uh, there's a lot of money it went down a plug hole with that but we're not here to talk about that we're here to talk about this there's this train that can trace its origins back to i think it's about 1862 and it uh, ran in various different guises with different railway companies principally the uh, london to edinburgh express and by the time the 1930s rolled by uh, they were using the then totally new Gresley A4 Pacifics and also the Gresley Teak coaches, but previously it had even been run with Pullman coaches, so quite a variety over the years. Now Hornby are pretty good at bringing out these, these train packs and uh, we've reviewed a number of them over the years. They've done the Hornby Northumbrian which featured the uh, Gresley Teak coaches but in their later blood and custard livery. And also we've featured the Hornby Bournemouth Bell comparatively recently. So they are a really, really good way of building up a uh, rolling stock and locomotive fleet that match each other, that, uh, you know, kind of complement each other. And the other thing that Hornby tended to do is that they would produce a coach add-on pack as well. I don't have that to go with these. But as far as I'm aware, there would have been a three pack of uh, additional coaches to make up a six coach matching train and the locomotive. But we've just got the basic set here. Now it comes, as you can see, whilst I've been talking, I've taken some of this uh, extra bum from that out. So we get this really nice certificate of authenticity. The Flying Scotsman, and it is numbered, it's uh, limited to 1,200, which is probably quite a lot, but they generally are sold out everywhere, so, you know, they're getting tricky to get, but uh, I've got number 0277, so in the grand scheme of things, that's uh, a lower number, and we've also got the signature here of Simon Kohler. They really did put a lot of effort into this. You know, it made it feel like this was something special, and we've got on the certificate a nice little bit of um, detail about the, the Flying Scotsman train, and it covers some of the details, which I've already said to you about the uh, the London King's Cross and uh, this is Glasgow Central so I was wrong there with um, Edinburgh Waverley uh, but it was really about um, 
London to um, Scotland. So it did actually pass through Edinburgh Waverley and it was actually the first train to do that non-stop from London King's Cross to Edinburgh Waverley which in the esteem era was actually quite a feat. So they had water troughs and underneath the tender there was a water scoop to enable that to happen. And actually the uh, tenders featured quite a novel corridor connection that allowed the crews to change over part way through the journey, which is very important because especially if you were the fireman, it's quite a physical and arduous job. So it's kind of nice to have somebody who can take over for a little bit. We've also got the paperwork here and it's just the, the bog standard maintenance routine and some details there about brake rods, things like that. The other thing that we can find in here is we get this um, it's a little bit of insulating sleeve and this is for if you want to DCC fit the locomotive. The locomotive is, is DCC ready, it's not actually chipped out of the box, but um, they give you this sort of sleeve which allows you to put the chip in that and uh, it just kind of stops any uh, niggles that you might get if uh, it's quite a close fit inside the body. We've got this huge expanse of polystyrene but actually I, but for the train packs like this I don't mind it too much. It gives you a nice solid uh, basis in which to keep the locomotive and the rolling stock when not in use and it does feel like you've got something special here. Now getting the locomotive out uh, we've got a single push hole in the back but they are quite a tight fit so you just got to be ever so careful not to pull the locomotive by any of the fragile detailing on it. I think I've got it there, yeah. So I'm just going to bring, oops, bring that out. And this has actually had all of the brake rigging, I just see in there, pre-fitted, um, even though it seems to mention in the paperwork about... Uh, uh, fitting that uh, yourself where it shows where to fit it. This particular one has got all of the uh, brake rigging pre-fitted. So I'm just going to put that to one side. In fact, I'm going to get everything out and then I can go through each of these in turn. So we've also got the tender and this is the period of the super detail locomotives that I actually preferred because we don't have the tender and the locomotive permanently coupled together. Instead, Hornby were using this incredibly clever, it's, well, it's sophisticated and yet simple at the same time, this tender drawbar that allows you to very easily connect and disconnect these, but it also allows power to be collected from the wheels on the tender and then fed back to the locomotive. So the locomotive is able to pick up power from the driving wheels as well as the tender wheels so that means that we get no stuttering whatsoever when this is going through point work. I have test run this locomotive, I uh, omitted to film it unfortunately so we'll try and get a few shots of this on the layout uh, but uh, believe me, despite the fact that it's been in the box probably for around 10 years uh, without seeing the kiss of daylight, it's actually, it just fired straight up and ran without any issue whatsoever. And that's testament to how good the mechanisms are on uh, these locomotives. Now it's just carefully get these out. These are the full super detail Gresley coaches and the London and North Eastern Railway livery and I've actually got quite a few of these coaches and it, it's something that I've touched upon when I've reviewed the uh, very early BR liveried ones and that is that the teak finish on the later ones Hornby has kind of cut corners a little bit and it, it's become very difficult to get the uh, teak finish coaches such as these in the, the early um, production runs where they, they had somewhere in the region of 20 passes with the tampo printing machine and that gives this really realistic effect where all the panels are separately um, tooled up and uh, the artwork's done so each 
separate panel looks like it's a different piece of timber as opposed to, I think I described them as the MFI wardrobe of uh, teak coaches of some of the later releases. So it is another point to make that if you're looking for these teak coaches with the really high quality printing finish, looking for some of this unsold new old stock in some of the smaller model shops, it's actually a really good way to get the high quality ones. These, the RRP for each of these individual coaches now has passed £55. So you think about it, for 150 you can get the three coaches for less than the RRP of three coaches now, and they toss in a free locomotive for you. So really, um, it, it's a very, very good way of expanding your coaching rolling stock. Each of them is uh, actually branded, uh, for want of a better word, it's got these coach name boards stuck on. They, they are actually pretty firmly stuck on there. Uh, and each of those say the Flying Scotsman, but it isn't a big issue if you want to mix them with coaches that don't have name boards, if you want to expand the, the train yourself. I think I've got about eight or nine of these now, so that's what I'll be doing. Now, let's quickly, I'm going to move those down out of the way. We're going to start here with the locomotive. What we've got is one of the Gresley A4 Pacifics named Kingfisher, and we've got it with the 1930s number, the, the original numbers. So we've got 4483. Later on, they uh, got renumbered, so they became, I don't know what the particular number of this locomotive would have been, but for example, Sir Nigel Gresley became number seven in uh, the later numbering series. It's presented in the Garter Blue livery. Uh, some of the locomotives, the, the initial ones, got a silver finish, things like Silver Link, Silver Jubilee, Silver King. But the later ones, uh, a lot of them got named after different birds. And then ultimately, some of the ones that were named after birds did get renamed for the names of some of the directors of the London and Northeastern Railway Company. I'm not entirely sure whether Kingfisher was one that got renamed or not, but here it is in its 1930s livery, looking resplendent in this garter blue. And it's a livery which I always remember with great fondness because when I was little, I had the Hornby 00 Sir Nigel Gresley in this livery, and it was one of my favourite locomotives. It is so eye-catching, and I think blue really does suit these locomotives. And uh, once the British Rail period came along, there was a final hurrah. I believe at least one locomotive was painted in the experimental blue livery, the BR experimental blue livery, but... And it really had to wait until preservation for us to see this lovely livery again. The model itself is the full-on Hornby Super Detail model. It was retooled uh, from scratch, pretty much, uh, even though the A4 has been a mainstay of their range, going right, right back. This was tooled entirely from scratch in the early period of production shifting out to China. So really, this had no expense spared. We've got really quite fine valve gear, and even though we've got the full valances on the side as per a pre-Second World War locomotive, uh, it's all completely in there a model which I suppose stands to reason because they would have just had one model chassis that was used on all the different uh, versions of the lids uh, but these valances when the locomotives first appeared they were all sleek and uh, smooth like this to uh, aid their passage through the air but as soon as the second world war came along uh, a lot of these valances were cut back in order to ease maintenance. It just made it a lot easier to gain access to the, uh, the valve chest and the uh, valve gear. All the wheels, uh, we've got chemically blackened uh, treads, and then we've got this correctly finished, it's almost like a very dark plum colour on the faces of the wheels, and all of them are finished in that, including the uh, pickup bogey wheels. And it's something that Hornby have previously struggled with the uh, the wheels on these uh, bogies and uh, and pony trucks 
have often looked a little bit toy-like, but there's no trace of that here. With this locomotive, Hornby have got everything right, and these wheels look entirely to scale. There's no pizza cutter treads or anything like that, and we've got a full range of motion on this front bogey. It's held in place by actually quite a, an interesting affair. It's very difficult probably on the camera to see, but there's a spring and uh, there's a good deal of travel. So it can go all the way from side to side, but it can also move up and down, backwards and forwards. And that just helps for this to be able to follow the track work quite closely. The trailing pony truck though, that's completely fixed. And uh, this was, Hornby went through a period of doing this. It must be said actually, it does remove any of the uh, rather unsightly air gaps that uh, would often appear in model form between the locomotive and the um, the pivot truck there. And the wheels themselves as well are flangeless. And the reason for this is, so when it goes around train set curves, it doesn't really matter that these wheels leave the track because there's no flanges to then derail things. And believe me, it does actually seem to work quite well. However, later on, Hornby did try and shy away from this fixed uh, pony truck arrangement. But I don't think it's too bad because generally speaking, these locomotives, they look a bit naff when they go around really tight train set curves. There's nothing you can do about that. So as a compromise, because we all don't quite have as much space as we would like to have. Well, unless your name's Pete Waterman, that is. So as a compromise, it's it's actually something that, you know, it's it's good to see in a way. It's, it's designed clever where it's designed clever. So it's a compromise that doesn't detract from the way the locomotive looks. On this side, we've got a representation of the Speedo drive. That's moulded in. It's actually wire. I'm feeling that. That's actually a piece of brass wire and uh, we've got sanding pipes which are very very delicate on the wheels the brake rigging as i alluded to before has been pre-fitted on this and uh, to be honest even if it wasn't i think it's one of those things where for me a lot of the time i don't bother fitting them because you'd never normally see it when the locomotive is running and um, you know it just adds to the complexity in the cab we have got a wealth of back head detail. So we can see in there all of the pipe work is individually picked out, the gauges. That is actually some exquisite work with the tampo printer. I don't think, I'm just looking closely there, yeah actually there are a few items in there which do look to be separately applied detail. Some of the handles there on the uh, on the pipework appear to be separately applied and the brake standard as well and then we've also got these very characteristic uh, sort of art deco style bucket seats that were provided for the driver and fireman in these locomotives i mean these locomotives very much were the epitome of the art deco scene from the uh, the 1930s but that i mean i'm looking in there and it's even down to the point where the gauges look like you could possibly even read the numbers off them. They are so exquisitely done. That is, for something that you wouldn't normally look at, that is really, really fine detail in there. There's, I mean, there's a wealth of separately applied bits and pieces. In fact, it's so hard to tell whether some of that pipe work, I'm not actually sure whether that is separately applied or whether it's tampo printed. That's how good it's been done, is that it looks like it's separately applied, but I'm not sure that it actually is. On the outside, we've got separately applied metal handrails and uh, the glazing is fairly flush there. And we've got a representation on the glazing insert of the wooden frame that these windows would have been set in. And you know, actually it works quite well. Again, on the front of the cab, flush glazed, that works really well. And then the number relief here. And this is an area as well where you can see how the costs racked up quite quickly with the tampo printing. Because that 4483, I can see one, two, three, four, possibly even five different passes with the tampo printing just to get those numbers there with this sort of serif relief. 
and it really does look good. There is no expense spared with the finish on this, this locomotive, and it is so sharp and crisp. We've also got the works plate there, and I've got every faith that it'll be fully readable under close magnification. On the side of the boiler, we've got very, very fine metal handrails on there, and they are lovely done, and they follow the curve of the locomotive perfectly. And then we turn to the front, and the very distinctive uh, curved front of these locomotives has been captured perfectly. We've got a turned metal whistle. We've got correctly fitted the single exhaust funnel on this. Uh, some of the locomotives later acquired a double exhaust funnel, but this is as built and correctly done on there. And I think Hornby actually did tool up both variations. We've also got, um, I think that's for a headboard. In fact, I will have a, a look in the packaging, but there may even be a Flying Scotsman headboard to go on there. And then we, we can look down here. We've got some very, very sharply finished lining on there in both red and white that follows this sort of... Um, this, this curved edge of the black smoke box front. And again, it's a shape that could have been very, very complicated, very easy to make a mess of, but Hornby have captured the likeness on this locomotive perfectly. On the front, we've got fully sprung buffers. These are very fine turned metal heads. We've also got the uh, number again of the locomotive applied there on the buffer beam. We've also got class A4, in uh, very very fine white lettering and then we've got this exquisite front coupling and it's made of of metal and it, it actually is so well done that you could imagine actually using this in model form you know it, it has to be said that this coupling i wouldn't be surprised if you could actually use it as a real coupling, although uh, it does look rather fragile. We've also got a vacuum fitted pipe on there as well and a number of uh, lamp fittings. Again, separately applied metal detail. There really is, I, I, I'm running out of superlatives. The locomotive is exquisite. I'm gonna turn quickly to the tender. Again, the exquisiteness of this model carries right on over into this part of it. And we can see here the very characteristic eight wheel tender with uh, all of the relief detail, the rivet detail, the axle boxes, the springs, all perfectly and very crisply picked out along the side. And I'm particularly drawn to these steps. They are so fine and thin and it's difficult to tell, are they moulded in plastic or are they a separately applied metal piece? Either way, they are actually really sturdy um, and uh, very, very fine. The wheels, again, we've got chemically blackened treads and then we've got this sort of dark plum colour on the faces and it really does look exquisite. The brake gear is all ready fitted, um, two pieces, one either side. The coupling on the back here held in the NEM pocket, so you can change it if you really want to. And uh, we've got buffers on the back there, again, turned metal and sprung. But uh, it has to be said, I'm not really sure how you would ever use these in their, their sprung capacity, because um, they just do appear to be ever so close to this corridor connection. Now, I, I touched on this earlier on, that they had means for the crews to change over partway through the journey without actually stopping the locomotive, and this was how they did it. So the corridor connection mated with the lead coach on the train, and if you look on the top there, there's a representation moulded of this very, very fine corridor down the side and then it reappears through this very tiny door at the side in the uh, in the tender. And it has to be said that uh, you couldn't have had an overweight footplate crew because there is just no way anything other than somebody who didn't really like eating a lot of food could have got down there. That is actually awfully, awfully small. Um, but it's all faithfully uh, reproduced in there. And then we've got, again, separately applied parts, these uh, handbrake standards. I think one of them actually may even be for the water scoop that would have been underneath. And we've got 
a couple of other bits there again separately applied and then we've got this this coal hole in there i can't actually it looks like it just goes back into a void uh like there's a an empty space inside here i'm not really entirely sure but i'm um, i'm just looking and seeing i'm not sure that the coal load comes out it's very difficult to tell whether it does or not i'm just going to see if i can oh it i can feel it moving I have a feeling I'm either going to break this or I'm going to reveal the inside of the tender. That is actually a really difficult fit. I don't know if I can see inside. I really don't really want to break this, but... Uh, there is definitely, looking down inside, yeah, the entire inside of the tender is perfectly moulded underneath there, but I don't seem to be able to get the coal load out, so I'm going to try and reseat that. But just so you know, if you really, really want to, this coal load does come out and there is a big empty void underneath and I can see the daylight coming through where the fireman would have shoveled the coal out. So the entire inside of this tender is moulded, ready to go. So you could actually model this locomotive towards the end of its run with uh, just a small amount of coal in the bottom if you want to do that with a bit of crushed real coal. And that really is such... It's, I'm struggling for words here because Hornby have tooled it to have the perfect representation of the inside of the uh, the tender coal area, even though most people are never going to see that. We've also got the water filler on the back, really, really nicely moulded there, and uh, separately applied metal handrail around the top there. We've got a window into the corridor. It's just like a little porthole window. I suppose, in a way, just to double check that there was a train there before you opened the door. You wouldn't want to sort of step off into the big unknown. The blue as well, perfect match to the actual locomotive. And again, we've got this, um, this Tampo printed LNER to the same standard, the same range of colours as the 4483 on the main locomotive. So um, I'm just going to very quickly show you that tender connection there. We have like a metal plate on the base of the tender and then we have this this sort of pole uh, for want of a better word. I think it's made it's made of something conductive and they're insulated from each other. So on the actual tender drawbar you can see we've got some tongues on the top there and again two sets of tongues on the bottom and they very cleverly mesh with each other so that when it's all attached, we get a connection to that metal plate from one set of these tongues. We get a connection to the pin with the other two, and that gives us our left and right power feed from the wheels on the tender. It's all very, very clever. The locomotive itself actually does run without the tender attached, but you get a much better um, response from it with their much less proneness to dead spots when they're coupled together. Although, I don't, <laughs> there'd never really be a reason that you would run the locomotive on its own. I'm going to move on now to the coaches that came in this set, and I'm not going to dwell on them a huge amount because we've already reviewed this type of coach from Hornby, and there's not really much more that I can add here with these, except to say that what we do get in this set, we get a buffet car, we get a first, third brake composite, and then we also get an all first coach. Now all of these have been in the main range as well, bought separately, but what makes these stand apart is they come ready fitted with these The Flying Scotsman name boards on the roof. So that's something that if you want that on all of your coaches, you're gonna have to buy the accompanying coach pack really to make that happen. Otherwise, you're gonna have to make do with, uh, I've got one here out of the uh, the cupboard. This is one of the regular coaches and you can see that they have no, uh, no name board ready fitted. 
So I am going to compare this, which is a full-on super detail, back when they were really making the effort with this wooden panels, to its counterpart that's in this set. And uh, what we can see there is pretty well matched. Um, we've got all the same detail, all the same finish, and um, there isn't really any, any difference between the main range ones and the train pack ones. But one thing I am going to show you is I've dug out what I call the, the MFI wardrobe special. So um, I'm going to put down there this is the one that everybody complained a lot about. When Hornby brought these out, they cut a lot of corners. And what you can see is that the wood grain looks like it's one huge piece of timber that the entire side's been made of, which is, of course, a load of rubbish. They would not have been made like that. You would have never got a piece of timber that would have been around... Well, the, the tree would have had to have been in the region of 100 feet tall, and that is just not going to happen. But we can see that on the version that comes in the train pack all the different panels are done to look like they are different pieces of wood and it, it's something that Zoe brought up she said this is just lazy because in CAD doing it this way is nearly as easy as doing it properly and what they've done is just cut and paste one texture and it's like select all panels one texture nobody will notice what well, we did and it came in for a lot of criticism but in this coach pack we don't have to worry about that the coaches are all absolutely pucker we've already reviewed this type of coach so i'm not really going to um, keep laboring the point on these they make a wonderful addition either as a complete train all to itself or to expand an existing collection of LNER teak coaches with an appropriate locomotive. There is one last thing which I want to take a look at and I noticed in the packaging we also get scrunched up and tucked away in a corner we also get an assortment of some user fitted details and if you want to put this locomotive in a display cabinet where it really isn't going to go around corners or if you've got something like an end-to-end -end layout, something that doesn't have anything other than the slightest of slight corners, Hornby also present you with a replacement set of wheels to go in that rear pony truck that have flanges. So if that really bothers you and you just want this in a display cabinet, Hornby have got you covered. The other things that we've got in here, we've got the uh, pipe work here for the drain cocks uh, on the cylinders. And this will go underneath. Again, you can only really fit this if you don't have anything other than the slightest of curves because they do foul the leading pony truck of the locomotive. And we've got finally also a, uh, I think it's a vacuum pipe for going onto the back of the tender if you so need it. I was hoping that there might be a um, headboard but it would appear as far as I can tell no that's just I think that no that's just a piece of scrunched up paper which shows you where all of these extra bits go on the uh, the uh, locomotive and here it would appear is the headboard so in there we've got a very very small and yet perfectly legible flying scotsman and that goes onto the front of the locomotive in the ready fitted holder there and what it suggests there it's suggesting attach headboard using blue tack um, although you have to be very careful not to make it look like a big lump, big football-esque lump of blue tack. But it just shows that there is so much in this set that Hornby have given you. And I'm just so glad that I found this new old stock in a model shop. So they are out there. Track them down. They're a perfect addition to your set. So on my arbitrary made up on the spur of the moment ratings, I have to go and give this a good solid 9.8 out of 10. There's not really any flaws whatsoever with this entire package. This is from back in the day where Hornby really did 
go that extra mile on everything that was in the super detail range and there's nothing I can fault. It, it's good value for money, it's good quality finish on all of the coaches and the locomotive as well is a good runner and a good finish and uh, the extra details go that extra mile even down to that headboard there and even down to the extra set of pony truck wheels if you want to display this in a cabinet and the flangeless wheels bother you so really there's, there's almost nothing that can be faulted with this well thanks again for watching don't forget to like this video share it too and also subscribe to the channel and ring that bell and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up but until next time this is me jenny kirk saying you take very very good care of yourself bye for now today's video has been brought to you in part thanks to the generous donation of my fans on patreon and a special huge thanks goes out to anthony kidson mark anthony and michael churchwood if you'd like to help support the show head on over to patreon.com slash jennifer kirk thank you Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Knobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.